Welcome to the Self-Helpful Podcast, where we break down the classic and cutting-edge wisdom of self-help to discern how to actually make positive change in our lives and get the results that we want. I'm Kevin Miller, and this episode, I'm back with Dr. Michelle Seeger to walk through her personal values, motives, and habits in the key areas of life fulfillment. Though in regards to habits, she is a self-labeled unhabiter, which we talked about some in the first show we'll talk more about today. So you're about to hear what that looks like. And I feel a lot of you, including me, are going to resonate and find some free, uh, freedom and equipping for your own unhabits. Michelle is an award-winning National Institute of Health funded sustainable behavior change researcher at the University of Michigan and a lifestyle coach who's pioneered methods to create sustainable, healthy behavior changes that are being used to boost health and well-being. Her new book is titled The Joy Choice, How to Finally Achieve Lasting Changes in Eating and Exercise. And as we talked about right at the end of the first show too, you can take a quiz uh, the traps quiz, isn't that right? That's what the decision it. trap quiz. Decision yes. traps quiz. You can take that at Michelle Seeger. That's S E G A R dot com slash. Is it jo uh, joy? I, you know what? I don't know what comes after. It's on the. It's actually you can access it on the homepage and the Joy Choice book page. So if they okay. just go to those pages, they'll find it. Go to michelleseeger.com. dot com. You'll find all you need. Uh, Thank you guys for tuning into the Self-Helpful Podcast. Leave us a review if you get value out of this. And the best thing you can do is listen to what Michelle's talking about today. Find something of value and share it with someone else. Next up, Michelle Seeger. All right, Michelle, I'm eager to hear this. We've, uh, on this aspect of habits and routines and these ways that we're trying to change our lives, I want to hear from you. So we'll start off the number one, just looking at what are the values you have here and what are the ways that you're practicing those out? Number one is spiritual. Yeah. So, you know, um, I became a more spiritual person in college. I took a, actually, I had an opportunity to take a class. It was, I don't know, I think it was called like the psychology of a religion. It was housed in, in psychology. Yeah. It was kind of flying under the radar. And so that really got me interested in spirituality in a way that I hadn't been before. And, you know, for me, um, the way I practice that is I, I, I think about the fact that we're all connected, you know, that, um, we're, we all share, a, a humanity and, thinking about us all as connected and, and, and being in nature, especially I cultivate that sense of spirituality inside of me. Um, I have been an aspirational meditator for, I would say 35 years. I love that, I love that term. I have a lot of places I need to adapt that I'm an <laughs> aspirational ex. Yeah, great. Well, it means that it's really important to me, yeah. but I don't, it, I haven't been doing it consistently for 35 years. And, yeah. you know, we talked about the self-care hierarchy in yeah. the other show. And that's because, you know, it is behind sleep for me and it is behind movement for me. But actually before this acute period with my book, I was consistently meditating between like two and 12 minutes on a daily basis or most days, which I think is a strategic framing of consistency on most days I do this um, for over a year. So those are some ways listening to music. I do have to just say, I recently read Bittersweet um, by Susan Cain yeah. and it really helped me retap into some spiritual aspects that I hadn't been thinking about her feeling and it, it was really moving to read. I, I was looking behind me. I've got her book. It was just sent to me probably a couple of weeks ago and she's, I, I think she's scheduled. So I'll have her on. So good to hear your testimony. Beautiful, beautiful okay. book. Um, okay. And, and the feeling of longing and how that is connected to spirituality. So um, I, I think the, because when I think about, values and what we want, what we value and, and how we try to realize the, them. I also think it's important to talk about challenges and realizing them. Yeah. So when I'm, when I have too much on my plate, I do not feel spiritual. I yeah. feel so busy with running from thing to thing that 
you know, in an intensive period. Now, if I live like this all the time, then I would really have to ask myself, are you living according to your values? Right. But I, I choose not to live like that all the time, but when I'm in these periods and I'm rushing, I feel like rushing is the anti-spiritual. I don't want to call it the anti-Christ. I don't know what that means, but it's like the anti-spiritual because, and I'm not as nice to my family. I'm not as nice to the homeless people on the street. I want to I want to be present and, and, and witness people and, and be there for them. And so rushing is the antith puts me in a place where I can't do that. No, I, I, that's great, Michelle. I just wrote that down. I'm going to, because, because yeah, right. If, if I define spirituality as ultimately, you know, something beyond self as a core foundation, however you experience that or pursue that something beyond self, when I am rushing, when I'm, as you said, talk in an acute period of time, I'm thinking about me. I really don't have much time to think That's beyond right. me. E- even me, I'm thinking about me, even in regards to the kids, I'm thinking about me. I've just got to get something on the table. I got to get a kid here somewhere. I'm still not even thinking about them. Even if I'm serving them by quote, it's on me. So if I'm rush, I, I, what you said, if I'm rushing, I don't feel spiritual. connected, connected, wow. right? Yeah. And, and there, actually there's a, there's a meme in there somewhere. There, uh, know. you know, and I have to say, I, I noticed that, I don't know, about 10 years ago, I kind of had that realization, but, and it's like, I don't like myself as much. Like, yeah. I don't want to, I don't enjoy who I am as much, but the other thing I want to say, there's actually been research about this and I don't, this isn't my area. So I, I might mess it up a little bit, but I think they showed that in general, it might've been about leadership and it might've been something that Adam Grant wrote a few years ago, but research shows that being rushed in this way, you know, I don't know if it impacts leadership, but it impacts a lot of things that we care about. So, you know, and you know, in our last show too, we talked about this issue of having too much on our plate. And, but now we're going from talking about how we have to navigate that with, you know, um, our self-care behaviors like physical movement and intentional eating with who we are as people and whether we embody the spiritual values that we might have. Totally. Totally. Well, we've mentioned along that with rushing, we just talked about you know, kids and family and whatnot. We talked about that in the first show. So the next one is relationships. So if we look at what is Michelle value and how are you practicing that? And especially maybe how you are in an acute period of time of rushing. Right. Well, feeling connected to my family, I would say is, you know, the, the core relational value and, um, you know, and I use as a gauge of whether I'm able to do that. You know, you can tell when you're kind of just taking care of business and when you're really, you know, being present and when you're really busy it, you have to remind yourself, you know, I, can, I value this, even though I am supposed to get on an interview in 10 minutes, right. And do yeah. a podcast interview. So, um, making sure that we do things as a family. And again, during this acute time, my family would tell you the acute time has been 14 months and not just the book launch. And, yeah. you know, and, and they're right about that. It's, it's, and so, it's important, I think, when we know we're compromising in, in one of our values to have in your mind uh, a stop point where you say, I'm not going to, it's not that I'm going to stop doing everything, but where you say, okay, I've compromised this for this period of time because of this, but I have to return to the practices that are in, helping me realize the values I have. And it it goes to friends. I really value my friendships. I value my relationships with my siblings and my parents. And so knowing, and this is where self-awareness, you know, you probably talk about this on your show all the time. Self-awareness is this key, you know, I don't want to know if it's a mental technology or just this key ability um, that we need to have because it's what helps us understand when we've gone too far in one of our areas of importance and yeah. we're compromising other things. Oh, well, I would put yeah on self-aware to, to some degree. It's, yes. It's along there of Holy grail and totally. And I would say what's enlightenment 
that's it. And Can I say something else though about please. relationships? Yes. The other way, especially during busy times that I've been um, making the perfect and perfect choice uh, so that I can be connected with friends, but, and, you know, but I, in a ways when I don't have time. So I'm walking and talking with friends. So I'm getting a walk in, which is really important to me when time is tight, but I'm also able to connect during the, or I'm having a walking meeting too. So the, it's the creed of compromises that we make that let us um, actualize our values when we have constraints on our lives in ways that we don't want to live with all the time. Well, and I hear you speaking. I, in my mind, I was thinking boundaries, uh, which I continue to have to have with work, especially with even just my own self-focus. I've got to have a boundary because I've got relationships over here that are part of my values that I want to walk out. So uh, health and wellness is the next one, which of course is a primary focus of the book, The Joy Choice, with the tagline again, folks, how to finally achieve lasting changes in eating and exercise which fall outside of the general container that we put, you know, goals and habits towards, they fall outside. So health and wellness, uh, yeah, again, first your own values. And I, I want to hear even specifically any specific dietary or exercise sure. re regimes that you stick to. Sure. Well, I value feeling, having a sense of well being, yeah. and that's my thermometer. Um, am I feeling like I have well-being, am I feeling stressed a lot? Am I worried a lot? Um, do I feel good about you know what I'm doing? So that's kind of my thermometer. And there's a lot of inputs into that. You know, first and foremost is sleeping. Yeah. And you know, I've been talking about sleeping. That is my foundational self-care behavior pretty much all the time. That determines whether I'm going to be excited in my day if I get a good night's sleep. If I don't get a good night's sleep, in general, I'm going to be cranky and I'm not going to feel good about things that I really should feel good about. So to me, that is that is the biggest lever in my health and well-being is whether I get a good night's sleep or not. And it's so important. And actually... Uh, this whole, both of our conversations, um, but with sleep, like my husband knows how impactful on me, my, you know, my sleep is. And in, because of how it affects me, it affects the, him and the rest of our family. So he has a vested interest to make sure that I get a good night's sleep and, and he will, you know, be a little, um, reminder, if I'm up working too late, he will, you know, encourage me at the beginning very gently. But if he knows, like if I go to bed at midnight, that is a recipe for misery for everyone the next day. Yeah. And I'm okay with him remind. I mean, I'm okay with him doing that. You know, I may not always listen to him because I have to finish something, but you know, I think part of the formula is to make sure that our families that we are vocal and model these values and make it a part of our family values, but also our, we have to articulate these things. And you know, we should talk to our kids about why we might decide not to get a good night's sleep one night or why we made, you know, here's a story. Oh, I'll stop. It looks like you no. might ask me something. No, 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 keep going. No. Okay, so I have a story just in terms of how we bring our families into it because not only are we creating a support structure around our own health and well-being choices and consistent choices, we're modeling to our kids. We are literally socializing, educating them for how to be in the world as a healthy person who embodies certain values. So that's, you know, that's like, an, that's a really important thing too. So in this busy time, I have this ideal walk. Here's, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. So here's my ideal physical activity. I walk to uh, a street that takes me about 25 to 30 minutes and back. And I'm walking through town and I'm walking through green neighborhoods or snowy neighborhoods, whatever it is. That's my ideal. It would be an hour. During this time, I haven't, you know, it's it's been hard to fit that in. And so one night about four weeks ago, I asked my family if we could take a walk around the block after dinner. And we're, you know, a few minutes out and my son kind of cocks his head and turns to me and astutely asks, mom, is this a joy choice for you? <laughs> That's awesome. He knew that I, you know, 
you know, because we don't take walks around the block every night. So, but I'd been talking about these ideas. And so he recognized that this family walk was the perfect and perfect physical activity. Now, what he didn't know was a great way to connect as a family, right? Yeah. So, so um, the idea is that we want to be, exp- we want, we think about the stuff in our heads, but we don't articulate it to our families and we really need to. The family values. I, I had a friend one time visiting, she talked about running. She says, yeah, we were kind of a running family. And, and I realized that was part of just who she felt she was and they were. And I've seen that with my family and now my kids that are older, that they don't all, they don't all run. They don't, none of them, one of them rides, you know? So some of the things that I do from an athletic standpoint, they didn't pursue, but they think of themselves as, yeah, we eat well, we exercise. And now I see my older kids doing that. I'm so grateful. Uh, right in line with what you said, I do just out of curiosity, I always like to hear about uh, people's diet. Is there anything sure. that you specifically, any, what's your dietary container? I'll ask. Oh, I like that question. Container. Well, I'm a golden rule gal. So I believe in the golden mean. Um, I think when we try to, when there are foods we have to stay away from now, there's always medical issues that this is not, does not pertain to, but right. part of what happens, and I've been seeing this for years and years with clients, is when you think you're when you have to rigidly follow something, yeah. it there's that rebellion, right? That's causes. So for me, um, over the years, I have gone from you know being a twenty something who was always like worried about what I would not, not in, in a real pathological way, just like in a normal way, um, thinking about oh I shouldn't eat this, I can't have the cake to deciding that, you know, um, I'm going to listen to my body. So my way of eating, I would say, and it wasn't always this way is really focused on, I'm, I really like, I've learned to love vegetables, like to eat a lot of vegetables. I cook a lot of stuff in garlic and olive oil. That's kind of my base. I'm not a very creative, um, uh, chef, but I really like what I cook. I love things like Brussels sprouts. I love things like greens, you know, think I just, and I did, I don't think I, I did not grow up liking this stuff. So I like whole grains, you know, I eat meat. Um, I like fish and, you know, in the last year, it's interesting. I went through many years where I wasn't craving sweets. Like I used to crave sweets, but I'm back to craving sweets again, for whatever reason, maybe it's the stress of the book launch, but I'm not, not letting myself eat that. I'm just, I'm noticing how much I'm eating and whether it actually makes me feel better or worse. Yeah. Um, so do, if you have any other questions, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I, I like, you know, the r- rigid aspect of it because I've, I've gone through those times of life and I now have really adopted in the past couple of years, my wife's uh, perspective. She says, no, we're flexitarians. We've gone through yes. every other Terry and we're flexitarians <clears throat> now. And I have let myself imbibe on things that I didn't, but overall, I think I'm probably better and, and definitely more at peace. So yeah, back to your, your rebellion that if we bring ourselves and I see that so often we get so rigid, it's kind of back to the exercise. We have to do X amount and we ultimately rebel and then fail. And then it's again, back to all or nothing, which is, I hear you. Which ri- rigid approaches to eating, again, if they're not ap- you know, necessary for medical reasons, really set people up. And that's what, you know, the yo-yo dieting is really about. And, you know, the, 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 the new thinking is really inclining towards intuitive eating and teaching people to get in touch with their bodies. And for me, you know, that's when I started maintaining weight when I, you know, I lost weight and maintained it because I listened to my body instead of trying to follow rules. Now, not everyone's going to do that because I've been coaching people in this for so long. Not everyone is going to lose weight when they start listening to their bodies. But I think once you get rid of the rules and start listening to the messages, I mean, that, that is regulate self-regulation. We regulate ourselves when we notice how we feel. Well, self-awareness, self-regulation yes. uh, is coming to the surface there. Well, the next one is, is mind and mental health. And I even, I really like to look at mental state kind of back to where we were in the first show. I'm yes. the kind of guy who has this kind of mental state. What do I want for myself? What do I value for myself? So I'm going to ask you that. And interestingly, just a minute ago, you talked about 
health and wellness wise, not wanting to be stressed and worried that those are not mental states that you want. So again, values, and then how are you practicing to be where you want? While feeling relaxed as part of feeling happy and like I have a sense of well-being. And I like the term well-being for a really specific reason. Being um, refers to the essence. Be to be means that one of the definitions is the essence of a person. So well-being means I'm being myself well. Wow. That's like, brilliant. you know, how meaningful and profound is that? Like, why isn't that what we want to be ourselves? Well, you know, and so for me, sleep is, is probably the key part of my mental health. You know, I will feel depressed and anxious and stressed when I don't get a good night's sleep. And if I go two or three nights without a good night's sleep, I'm, you know, I'm bordering on desperation because of, I just don't feel good um, mentally. So that I would say that is probably the biggest thing. I think connection with people is a key part of mental health. If I feel disconnected because my family, we haven't spent time in a meaningful way in a while, that leaves me feeling unwell mentally. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's this formula for mental health that, that has to include um living according to your values. And when you don't, there's this disconnection with not just the people that you care about relating to, but with who you are. And I think when you notice those feelings, it's a, it's a symptom that something is awry in how in the choices you're making and, and your daily life. And sometimes it's not, you know, sometimes choices are made for us. Like if we lose our jobs, you know, that is also right. a recipe to not feel very well. So sometimes we aren't in control of things, but I'm answering the question based on the things that I do have control over. Yeah. And I appreciate your continued coming back to sleep. That is it's something we talk about here on the show a lot. I talk about recovery. I'm more focused on recovery today than I ever have been because I can still perform at a high level. I find myself needing more recovery um, than I used to. So I'm focused on that and sleep has just, I think I kicked against that for so many years because it didn't feel productive. Uh-huh. I go exercise. It's productive. If I eat something healthy, it's productive. If I deal with my finances or relationship, it's productive sleep. I'm not doing anything. And I used to say, I wish I could just have a pill instead of mm-hmm. having to sleep. So I could just do more stuff. And I'm, it's been a long journey. So to hear you come back and confirm that is we're uh, physiological beings. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, Next one, work, career, business. Again, the values in there. And I'm interested, you know, you are, as, as most people I have on the show are, you're in a, an acute time of life with a book launch or an event or something like that. But you are, you know, you've got your, you've had your current work that you have been doing and you decided to add a book to it. And that right. added a lot to it. Now with that book, you have podcast interviews and you have other things going on that's invariably opening up opportunities for speaking engagements and things like that. So I, I imagine it's brought you to a point more acutely now of looking at, okay, what do I value with my work? What are the boundaries I'm going to have for it? What are the, what are the ways I'm going to practice keeping right. it where I want it to be? Right. Well, I'm, th- this gets back to the well being so much and the choices we make professionally. I mean, I've been doing professional speaking, you know, keynotes for a long time. I love speaking and I love creating my presentations um, with designers to help me embody concepts in visual ways. And that's part of being creative. So getting back at the things I value, I really, being creative is a need for me. And, And if I, if I'm not being creative and kind of in my brain in some way, then, um, I will not feel happy and, and have a sense of well-being. So that is a core ingredient from a mm. business perspective into who I am and what I need to for my health and well-being. Um, I have got, I know that if I travel too much close together, that um, not only won't I be with my family, but it, it's exerting too much energy output. And I need, and it, it puts me in a state of, uh, of needing recovery that I don't like that an extreme state. So in general, um, 
And for the book launch, I didn't have the luxury. Well, I chose, it wasn't that I didn't have the luxury. I chose to do back-to-back -back trips because of this, again, I'm in an acute period. If I did it all the time um, for the fall and beyond, when people have been asking me about speaking um, gigs, I've been very clear on, you know, when I am committed and when I'm not, and part of the commitment period that I am unable to travel and accept speaking opportunities includes um, enough buffer around the other opportunities. So it's not that maybe there might be a free day, but if it's two days after or before another large keynote, you know, I'm not going to take it um, because it, it, it goes against my values and my health and well-being. Does that, that's just one. Yeah, I hear, I hear boundaries again. Uh, yeah. In, in there, which. Yeah. But I had to learn that. that. Yeah. Right. So. Um, I value, you know, when it comes to my values around my work, I do my work, um, to help individuals change the, their belief systems and strategies so that they can be more successful. I have a tiered, a tier that I value. I, I care about helping individuals. I care about helping the professionals who both um, are creating new research and making sure that they're using the theory and frameworks that are um, that most adequately address the realities of people's lives and what the emerging science says, not science that people might be comfortable using. I care about helping professionals who um, coach people, who um, counsel patients. Um, I, I care about scale. So while I started my work caring about just individuals, I've cared about impact and scale and how the principles that I've discovered work on individuals can be scaled that or in ways organizations can use and professionals and ultimately the messages across the societal level that are being um, delivered um, top down. Well, it's interesting, again, just looking at your work values and that question of scale um, of where you want to go. I mean, you're, you know, you're fulfilling this, you have an opportunity with your students and with people to, to participate, engage with them, help them. And uh, part of your work career business is you wanted to take it to more people. And that's not something everybody has to do, needs to do, but I'm right. curious to see those who feel called that direction. The next one, Michelle, is money, finances, uh, wealth. And I hit on this one in the first show. This is an area, it's not my most favorite. I'd rather go for a run uh, than deal with money. It doesn't matter how much I have. I don't, I, you know, I've got my own baggage there, but that's one where we see people run awry have anxiety, have stress, have worry, and not have flexibility, all these things that we talked about in the first show. So money, finances, wealth, what are the, the values that you have come to and how are you practicing those? Um, I value feeling secure. That has always been a value, which leads to a, a savings, a strong savings behavior. Um, I value enjoying the moment and life and eating delicious food. So that also means that I spend money on, you know, with good ing with ingredients that I want to eat or going to restaurants that I really enjoy. You know, I feel I feel very comfortable with money. So I you know, don't feel the same way that you do in terms of gritting your teeth. I, you know, um, when it comes to this kind of stuff, I have a, a monthly reconciliation thing that I do with our checking account. And actually that's not true. I do not enjoy, you know, going item by item, going through yeah. the credit card and categorizing it, but it's a practice that I learned from my dad and I value doing it. It makes doing our taxes really easy at the end because I can generate a report. So yeah, yeah no, I, I am, um, but I, I enjoy both saving and, you know, and spending on the things that I care about, like food. Yeah. That's, that's one of my favorite expenditures. I, I never have any remorse for spending money on food. That's, that's top level right there. Yes. Achievements and interests. And this one, Michelle, is one that's just, I've grown in curiosity uh, over the years with people. And, you know, cause we, we're often talking about the work and the, you know, the effort out here. And uh, I've found interest in just seeing what you enjoy for yourself. What do you pursue just for you? It may be 
you know, hobbies, fun, play? What are the things you're going to do outside of the work that just give you that smile like you have right now on your face? What does sh share some of that? Well, I have been a hobby wannabe my whole life. And huh. I, I find, you know, I wanted to garden. So I tried gardening. I wanted to knit. So I tried knitting. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I, I, what I'm most interested in is the things I do for work and my family and my friends and eating and walking. So the things that we've talked about really constitute the things that give me pleasure. You know, um, I've over the pandemic, I started watching TV, which was an activity. Our whole family started watching TV um, in a way that we never had before. And I embraced that. I thought, oh, finally an activity that I can enjoy that isn't related to, you know, creativity and thinking. Um, I think I'm, and, and so, you know, I do, I, I, when I feel, when I'm looking for something to do to, to recover a bit from my work, um, I'm looking to TV these days, it's, you know, um, because that is just entertainment and that's important. You know, that's part laughing or just letting go of things that I've been thinking about. But yeah, I don't really, I, I wish I could say I had a hobby because it feels like something that could be important, but I just haven't found one that fuels me in the way all these other things do. What feels like play to you? Is it, is it aspects of work that you feel like? Play Sometimes. work is very playful. F spending time with friends and family is playful. Playing, you know, ping pong. So actually, I guess we have a ping pong table in our house, and that's a way that we play in our family. Um, but you know, being playful with people, you know, through joking or you know, however that is. Um, I'm trying to think when I was back in the day, I loved to dance and I still love to dance, but I don't have opportunities, you know, if there's no wedding or something. So it's been a few years since I've, you know, boogied down on the yeah. dance floor, but <laughs> I love to dance. Yeah. So I think, I guess that's something. You, and you, you've mentioned through this conversation multiple times, creativity. Um, that's a, a, a top level focus for me, that is when I am, I had Steven Kotler on the show uh, last year, I guess. And he you know, runs the flow Institute and has all, all the, all the books. And we talked about flow and having mastery in something. And for me, creativity, now I can find it out in the mountain bike trail or a technical trail yes. run where I'm in, in flow, but also in my work creation, it's during the creative time that I feel the most flow and ultimately fulfillment. You've talked about that a lot. Well, it's, you know, you're right. So the playful aspect and, and a lot of my work I do in partnership with other people. So okay. when I'm working with a graphic designer, for example, who, you know, someone, a partnership that I've had for, you know, decades at this point, who helped me, I'm talking about maybe a scientific finding or phenomenon that I want to relate to the public and help people understand and have ahas. That process of working with an expert in visual depiction and graphic design, that's play for me. So yeah. it's creativity. And I have to say, I guess it goes beyond just playful. It goes to a core sense of self and even fulfillment as an individual and spirituality. So it really goes very deep, at least for me, it does. And on this aspect, you know, I, I have in their achievements, I have, again, become curious with myself and others. So was this, so here you are going along in your work and doing some speaking and you decided to write a book. Was that just an outpouring of, I, I, I just want to get this out to more people or, and, and an aspect of wanting to see myself as a, as an author, that's a, that's another achievement. It's another aspect that I want. And I asked that with a biased view, I'm in the middle of my book right now, and I haven't done that yet. And I'm eager to experience that achievement and that different level of work. Sure. So my career path has always been multifaceted. You know, mm -hmm. I was never just a researcher. I was, um, 
a researcher and a health coach and a speaker. And then I became an author. And, you know, the role of books, there's a couple roles. My first book, which I published seven years ago, was represented a, a solution um, for how to convert exercise from a chore to a gift and develop that high quality motivation, which we've touched on in our right. other conversation a little bit. That was to show people through science and practice, because I showed them my coaching protocol. Um, the last 20 years, it was like a culmination of 20 years teaching, getting it out in the world so it could be used and so gratifying how it is being used. Mm. This book is completely different. This book, my second book, in fact, I never thought I would write another book. Um, I thought, you know, that was my life's work. I shared it. I'm, I'm kind of done. That's kind of how I felt. But um, while I, we were living in um, Australia for my husband's sabbatical, and I had some downtime, you know, I was still working, but I had this beautiful leisure time and I was walking down the street and I had this like tap on the shoulder um, that started the process of this new book. And so this new book is going to be the next 20 years of my career, because in it, it's really about what's emerging um, in the scientific literature and new practices that I've been doing with my own clients. And yeah. I feature a lot of other people's work in this book rather than my own work, um, which was really the centerpiece of No Sweat. So I'm, I'm now going diving into this, all these new fields um, in my own work because that's what I'm interested in playing with, if you will. Yeah. Well, I am great. Thanks for coming and playing with me today. This has been, this has been play. This is play for me. It's a, uh, uh, to have a conversation over, over something that matters and thanks for sharing. Yeah. Kind of the behind the scenes on you. And uh, I am grateful for the play and creativity you brought us and this message, Michelle, thank you again for being with us. Thank you for having me. It was fun for me too.